Now what happened is they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. Hallelujah. We'll be preaching from a series this month called All In. All In. And today will be part one of that series. I want to share some things that God has placed on my heart, laid on my heart. But uh, let me ask you, how many of you all today would say that, Pastor, I love God, have a relationship with God, and I'm all in? Amen. Amen. You don't sound too sure. Amen. 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 They may be some that aren't sure, but you'll be sure hopefully before you leave. Amen. Amen. I'm all in. Amen. Can't go back. This text that I read today, I want to highlight a few things for you this morning that I think can give us understanding as to what Jesus was saying. I want to preach to you from that subject, all in. Amen. Father, again, we thank you for your presence that's here, your word that is rich. I pray that it would find someone today where they are and that it would meet them at the point of their needs. God, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Touch my mind, my body, and my thoughts. God, give me wisdom. I yield myself to you, God. It is your anointing that makes the difference. So today, God, I covet your anointing, and I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm sure our deacons are watching the war. I'm going to make sure I'm going to start flowing over on me while I'm preaching. <laughs> Amen. I want to talk to you about a topic that I believe is significantly important based on the times that we're living in and the heart of our current, the heartbeat of our current culture. That is, when I say all in, I'm really talking about at the heart of that is one word, and that word is commitment. Commitment is something that's hard to find these days because we've been taught that it is okay to uproot and do what we want. It might be marriage, it might be a friendship, it might be a relationship. In fact, I've been a part of the federal government for many years, and it used to be at one time you could work in the government, and if you tried to leave after five years, they'd say you were not committed. But now they encourage people after every two years or so to change. It's called getting experience and diversifying your resume. So today, in the age that we live in, commitment is a hard thing. And I want to share with you what I believe God has put on my heart in terms of just our spiritual lives and what God is saying to the body of Christ. In this text that we read, Jesus is speaking to three different individuals about discipleship or what it means to follow him and what it costs to follow him, what the cost of discipleship is. In Jesus' response to these individuals, Jesus highlights three unchanging principles that every follower of Christ must accept, but not only accept, we must embrace. In verse 57, he says this, he say, it says, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to them, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. We heard some other apostles say that, that by the name of Peter, who said, I'll follow you wherever you go. But as soon as adversity hit, what happened to Peter? Jesus talked to this disciple, and in other words, this man was saying, I'm making a decision to follow you. Basically, he's saying, I, I, I believe that you're God, I believe that you're Lord, and I'm going to follow you. I'm making the decision to follow Christ. But look at what Jesus responded in this verse 58. It says, and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, Jesus was saying to him, it's more than just saying that you're a Christian and that you're going to follow me. 
I'm glad you want to follow me, and I'm glad that you see the value in becoming a disciple of Christ, but it takes more than just you saying, I'm going to follow you. So Jesus teaches this first principle of discipleship when he said, Foxes have holes, birds of the nest have, a birds have their nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What Jesus was really saying was, I walk as my Father leads and as he provides, and if you want to follow me, there'll be some times when you won't be able to predict your next step. But you'll have to learn to trust me for the unknown. That first principle is this. If you're going to follow Christ, you must be willing to face the unknown. Jesus said, I don't even know where I'm asleep tonight. If you're going to follow me, you have to be okay with trusting me for the unknown. The Bible says this is why God honored Abraham, because he trusted God for the unknown. The Bible says that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him as a righteousness. God said, get up from your country. I'm not going to tell you exactly where to go, but I just need you to move and trust me for the unknown. If he ever stepped outside of what was predictable to trust God for the unpredictable, he would have never been able to be blessed and become the father of many nations. As believers, we got to stop being afraid of what we can't see, Amen. what we can't predict, or what we can't call. We've got to be stop being afraid of that and simply abide in Him. Yeah. I realize that this defies all of human nature because our nature uh, wants to have predictability. We want to know what's going to happen tomorrow, and we want to know what's going to happen next month, and we want to be able to say what's going to happen. In fact, we do five and ten year plans, and they are good to do, but sometimes you just can't predict what's going to happen. And as believers of Christ, you and I have got to learn to be okay with not being able to say what is going to happen. How do we do that? John 15, 4 says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless you abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abiding in him means maintaining ongoing fellowship. You know what I've learned about today's church is the reason we have a difficult time trusting God and the reason we have uh, times when we kind of toss to and fro is because today we teach good preach we preach good preaching and we teach good teaching and we give people the word and we lead them through the sinner's prayer but they never come to a transformation experience you can sit on the good preaching and still not be transformed you can sit on a good teaching and your life still be raggedy. It's not until there's been a transformation in your life that things will change in your heart. Abiding in Him means that you have to take some time to spend with Him. You have to take some time to commune with Him. You have to take some time to walk with Him. It's not enough just to say a five-minute prayer on Sunday morning before you go to church or a five-minute prayer before you go to bed at night, but you've got to learn to know His heart and let Him know your heart. That's abiding in Him. The times that I've had the most turmoil in my life are the times when I draw nearest to Him. And He gives me a peace, the Bible says, that passes all understanding. But it only happens when you abide in Him. What does that word abide mean? Put it in plain language. It means to stay. It don't mean to sometimes be in and sometimes be out. It means to stay in Him. It means to delight yourself in Him. It means to commune in Him, to think on Him, to meditate on Him, to pray to Him, to read His Word. It means to stay and keep yourself in Him. And in those times when there's the unpredictable facing you, if you're abiding in Him, it's well with your soul. Jesus says to this disciple, he says, I know you say that you want to follow me, but are you okay if we walk right now and leave and you have no idea where we're going? That's a challenge for the church. Sometimes Jesus asks you to take a step and he never tells you which your destination is. Jesus says to this disciple, if you really want to follow me, if you truly want to follow me, you have to be okay with that. Not only okay, but you have to learn to embrace it. In fact, I've found it in my life, especially in ministry, it's been more that case than the other. It's always been the case that I have to trust God. I don't even understand. I don't even know what God is doing sometimes. 
And I realize that there are some who would say that, well, you have the gift of discernment and all of these things, but sometimes God just don't share his mind with you. He don't share his heart with you. He's sovereign. And sometimes I think what God is saying, I just want you to walk with me. I just want you to walk as I walk. I don't need to share every detail with you. Just walk as I walk. So he tells his disciple, he says, if you want to follow me, you have to understand that there will be some unknowns. Gives us to the sec takes us to the second principle with verse 49 or 59 and 60. Look at it here. Verse 59 and 60. Then he said to another, follow me. He said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Now when we read this, it's easy, if we don't read it in its proper context, it's easy to believe that Jesus was being insensitive. What this really means is what Jesus, what this man was really saying was, let me first go and bury my father. Uh, I want to continue to live with him. See, in biblical times, the custom was that they would stay with the parent until they died. So it wasn't that the father was on his deathbed. He was saying, let me go back home and stay with my daddy until the day he dies. So Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. In other words, he was saying, you don't have time to be indecisive. You don't have time to live in the valley of indecision, which gives us the second principle, and that is, if you're going to follow Christ, you cannot live life on the fence. If you're going to be a true follower of Christ, you've got to get off the fence sometimes. That's the word of God for you today. Get off the fence. Sometimes as Christians, we can go through our faith walk living on the fence. But James tells us in James 1.8 that a double-minded man is unstable in all their ways. A double-minded man is a person who's divided in their thoughts. They're divided in their heart, divided in their thinking. They have faith, but then they doubt. They're a person that wants to move, but then they want to stay. The Bible says that you're unstable in all your ways when you're double-minded. And sometimes we find ourselves living on the fence. I need my ushers here to help me. i got a prop. My wife has been rubbing off on me. <laughs> This came to me, and I want to share this with you, because I think sometimes the um, giving you a, a, a paradigm or giving you a model of what I'm saying will help to give you understanding. Move swiftly, move swiftly. <laughs> he just glad. <laughs> I got sermon preached. <laughs> Amen. This finger right hit you, sir. Anybody know what that is? That's a fence. It's a wooden one. It's got splinters, so don't get a splinter again. We have to learn as a church and as people of God to sometimes get off the fence. Sometimes in our lives, and I think there are different ways that we're on the fence, but how many know that sometimes on the fence, very comfortable? You can see very well from the fence. You can evaluate your perspective and where you want to go and what you want to do. But the difficult thing is to one day get off the fence and go for it. See, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, he said that I wish that you were either hot or cold. But because you're neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, there are different applications for that scripture. But what he was saying to the church is that some of you all, and I can't do this, but some of you all are straddling the fence. You got one leg on one side and another leg on another side. And the question that God has to the church today is how long are you going to be in the church and get the word of God and see this presence of God move and still not make a decision to change the way you live? Now, I know I'm not preaching to everybody this morning, but God spoke this to me as I was in a time of prayer. Some of us have been in church for a long time, but we still have not got off the fence. We still got one leg on one side and another leg on another side. We still got that stuff that we need to let God take out of us simply because we decided that it's good on Sunday morning, but Monday through Saturday, we take our position right back on the fence. Can I tell you that we don't have time, church, to straddle a fence? 
You don't have time to straddle a fence. Do you know there's a very real devil that desires to kill you and destroy you? And the most dangerous place in your life, hear me now, the most dangerous place in your life is not when you're walking or facing the uncertainty or the unknown while that feels dangerous. That is not the most dangerous place in your life. The most dangerous place in your spiritual life is when you are right here straddling this fence. Some of us have prayed to be saved, but there's been no heart transformation. I know y'all sanctified. Don't worry, I'll get to you in a minute. God is calling the church to a genuine faith. Not a counterfeit faith. Not one that knows how to say amen, but doesn't know how to pray demons off of their family. Not one that knows how to pray and is speaking tongues, but don't know how to lead somebody to Christ. It's time out for counterfeit faith. It's time out for the church being super spiritual and super holy, but don't have no power and couldn't pray five minutes if somebody paid them to. It's time out for superficial faith. God is calling the church to a place where we are sincere about our faith. And there's been a true transformation of heart and not just an excitement or an emotionalism. I'm the most emotional preacher probably you've ever seen. But I understand the difference between substance and emotion and the anointing and emotion. And what a lot of folk get on Sunday morning is they get emotional and they cry and they shout. But there is no change in their life. And God is calling the church to a change and transform life. Even folk that's been saved for many years have found themselves, honest God, I have to preach what God give me, have found themselves reverting back to cussing and drinking and all the stuff that God delivered them from. I believe somewhere in scripture it says be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now I understand there's a deeper theological meaning but for the purposes and the context of this message the enemy will try to re-entangle you with all the mess and the stuff that God delivered you from and if you are not careful and if you live your life on the fence you will find yourself saved for 20 years and still going back and forth and God is trying to pull you out and Satan constantly pulling you back. So he says to this young man, you're telling me you want to follow me, but at the same time you want to go back and live in your place, your home, until your father dies. Jesus says, you don't have time for indecision. You don't have time to figure it out. Leads me to the next point I want to make. Straddling the fence is not only just people who are kind of living right and not living right. I don't know why I can't get off of that. Somebody this morning needs to make a decision. It's a little different this morning. Somebody needs to make a decision today. You've been playing with God too long. God, I pray that you touch the heart of someone today. It needs to make a change. Allow you to transform their hearts and their minds. Pray today, God, that you would do it by your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name. Don't, even, don't ever accept a false security because you're in church. Because you know about church and the things of church that you're safe. You have to be born again. You have to know him in the full part of your sins. There has to be a change, a transformation. We'll get to my next point. The Holy Spirit has just stopped me right here. I'm stalled right here for a moment. It's not okay to come to church every Sunday and go home. 
live the, live the same way that week you lived the week before. It's never okay to come in contact with the presence of an almighty God. Leave off the way you came. God wants you to get off the fence today. There's some other ways we straddle the fence. Some of us, God has been speaking to our heart about some things. He's been talking to us about some things that he wants us to do. He's been speaking to some of us and telling us to go and initiate a conversation, make amends with a family member or a friend or someone who has hurt you. He's speaking to you about your gifts and things that he's called you to do. He's speaking to you about that book that he's been telling you to write forever. He's speaking to you about that business that he's told you to start and you're afraid to jump out into the deep. And God is saying this morning that you need to get off the fence. Sometimes God speaks to us about things and sometimes we can pull back and we can become distracted and God brought me this morning to bring some things back to the forefront of your mind that he's spoken to you years back or even weeks back or months back and you have somehow blocked it out and God is saying today it's time for you to move. It's time for you to make a decision. Some of you God has called to do different things and you sitting around waiting. God wants you to get off the fence today. Mm. See, when he says that, I wish that you were hired a cold, he's not just talking about your spirituality. He's talking about the fact that you and I have got to learn how to make a decision and not live in that valley of indecision. Mm. It's just easier sometimes to just hold what you got, stay right there on the fence, and wait for God to send some angel or something to speak to you. God is saying, today, you have to get off the fence. He's been speaking to you about your prayer life. He's been telling you he needs, this. he needs more of you. He's been speaking to you about fasting. He's been speaking to you about the various things that uh, he wants to do through you and in your life. And you've been on the fence. He's been speaking to you about taking care of your health and your physical body. And you've been on the fence. He's been speaking to you about stepping outside of your comfort zone and you have not yet moved because you've been on fence. God said this morning, it's time to get off the fence. That means something different to every one of us. But there's things that God is speaking to your heart. Maybe that he wants you to become more committed to your church, more committed to your faith, more committed to your family, more committed to your job. But today, whatever you do, get off the fence. Jesus said to this man, he said, you want to follow me, but you're simply making excuses for why you can't get off the fence. He said, let the dead bury their own dead. You're telling me that you need to go back home, but you need to take action right now. How many know that timing is everything? If you miss the right timing, then you miss what God has for you. See, the fruit on the tree has to be harvested at just the right time. Otherwise, if you leave it on the tree too long, it becomes stale. So you and I have got to learn how to discern the times when God is saying move and you need to harvest the fruit when he says harvest it. Why is it that people often choose to remain on the fence? A couple of reasons I want to share. First of all, the fear of the unknown, which I just mentioned. But the other is the fear of failure. We oftentimes choose not to move from our place of comfort and predictability because we're afraid we'll fail. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a righteous man may fall seven times, but they rise again. You know what I've learned about this faith walk is that there's going to be many times you're going to fall. There's going to be many times in this life that you're going to fall. And as you try to get it right, you're not going to get it right. There's going to be many times that you're going to scrape your knees and times that you're going to have to start over. But it's the one who gets back up that wins the crap. In fact, isn't that what the salvation story is all about? It's about the fact that man and humankind fell back in the Garden of Eden. But Jesus came so that we could get back up. 
One disciple said, how many times should I uh, forgive a person? Jesus said, you forgive them seven times, 70. That means that you continue to forgive. That's the kind of love that Jesus has for us. Can I tell you today that you may have tried to do some things you thought you were getting off the fence, and because you it didn't work out the way you had intended for it to work out, you got off the fence just long enough to look and see how dangerous it looked to you, and you jumped right back on the fence. But God wants me to tell you today that he's using his holy hand, his spiritual hand, to push you in your back to tell you to get off the fence. So what if you fall? So what if you make a mistake? So what if it don't work the first time? I'm coming to find out that the Holy Ghost people, people that love God, people that are saved and sanctified, are some or should be some of the most resilient people around. Because we know that we've got a help that other people don't have. And if you fall, you just get back up. If you mess up, you just try over again. Sometimes we resolve ourselves to defeat. I'm not going to ever be able to do this, God. This is not ever going to work. The devil is a lie. The Bible says that all things work together. So what I've come to learn is that every time I fall, there's a lesson in my fall. There's value in my mess up. There's value in my mistake. Amen, somebody. There's value in me getting it wrong. No, I don't set out to get it wrong, but there's a lesson that I can learn in getting it wrong. And it is that God is a restorer of the preachers. He can restore all things. And so when I get back up, the only travesty would be to get back up with the same mind I fell. The only thing I resolve myself to is not that I'm perfect because I'm far from perfect. I know that I'm going to fall. But what I resign myself to is that I will not get back up with the same mind. I might fall this way or fall that way, but when I get up, it's going to be a different mindset. And so Satan may have tricked me with that this time, but it won't get me with that way. Yeah. Fear paralyzes yes, the people of God. Yes, Fear will keep you from yes. moving when God is telling you to move. Jesus. Keep you from moving and taking action when God tells you to act. I'm not preaching you preaching to you something that just sounds good. I'm preaching you something that I've lived. That I still live at times. Some things can just be flat out scary. I feel like maybe I'm just preaching to myself. I found myself at times praying like Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, I really don't want to do this. I really don't want to go through this. I really don't want to experience this. I really don't, Father. I am afraid I'm not sure what the outcome will be. But if you don't get off the fence, you never have all that God has for you to have. I've also learned that most of the time, my getting off the fence is more for somebody else than it is for me anyway. Not only are we afraid of failure, but we also fear what other people think. People pleasers. We're afraid of what somebody else may say. If I listened to what somebody else had said to me in 10th grade, I would be standing in front of you now. Because somebody else said that's right. That you don't have the ability to do that. That's right. Or that you don't have the capacity to do that. Preach. My question is, what did God say? If God is speaking it to me, then I don't care what you have to say. I know that sounds kind of mean, but you know, every once in a while, we've got to get that mindset, especially in church. My God. Church folk can be some of the most talking people that I've ever seen. And sometimes they come to you with a question where they say it's just a question, but it's really a loaded question. A way to kind of put I know I'm preaching right now. I know I'm preaching right now. It's a way to just kind of plant a seed there to give you something, see if you won't carry it, but you know what I learned to do? I let it go in one end right out the other. I don't need to listen no more. I learned to just listen to what God says and let God be God. And I know the people in my life who are spiritual enough to know what God is saying. And if somebody comes to plant a seed that's not of God, I learned to say thank you, God bless you, and keep moving on. Used to lose sleep over that mess and lose sleep over what people saying and what people thinking. I've learned we ain't got time to be losing sleep over stuff. We don't have enough time. Jesus is soon to return. I don't have time to wonder what somebody else is thinking or saying or doing. And you know what the truth is? Sometimes it may be what you say, but at the end of the day, God's got to fix it. And if God don't fix it, 
Sunday morning almost a preacher gets up and wonders how people are going to receive what I'm about to say. How are they going to receive? What are they going to think? Are they going to say you did a good job and I did a good job? But I thank God I graduated. Thank God. I graduated. I serve God and help me graduate. I said God as long as your word is done for that's all about. But you said your word will never return to you more. But it will accomplish what you sent me to do. I thank God that I'm graduating and some of y'all need to graduate today. So what if somebody else seen you fail? Get up and try again. So what if somebody is praying with you about that thing for a different time? Get up and try again. Who cares what other people think? Find some people who love you sincerely and some people who care about you and pull close to you and let them encourage you. They will know who are going to stand behind you and gush it off every time you call. They will gush your hands off and push you forward and cause you to move with God. We got too many church folks, it's amazing, who encourage people to stay on the net, stay on the perch, to stay on the fence. They encourage you not to do it again, not to try it again. We already tried that one time and it didn't work. But you know what I've learned? That it may not work again, but I'm going to try it anyway. It may not work this time, but I'm going to try it. I'm going to pray over it. I'm going to ask God to anoint it. And we're going to see what the end is. You can't always predict what's going to happen, but you can see what the end's going to be. Trust it. sitting back yep. like a nervous puppy, yep. watching and wondering, and God says Preach. you don't have to have all the answers Preach. before you move. You don't have to have all the answers before you move. Somebody else need to hear that. Yes, you don't have to have all the answers before you move. Woo. The Bible says that the steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord. The Bible also says that man may make plans in his heart, but it's God who establishes his footsteps. And so it's liberating to know that while I may not understand or know what God is doing, I am willing to take a step. And I know that if I take a step, the steps of a good man are ordered and directed by God. He won't allow me to fall. Don't allow people to dictate your happiness. Amen. Jesus said in John 6, 38, I got to stop. He says, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. You're not here to please and perform for the will of other people. You're here to please and do the will of God. Sometimes we live on the fence because the fence is comfortable and we're lazy. Uh-huh. 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 I love it. Go on, say amen. 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 Verse thirteen four says, "The soul of the sluggard craves." And gets nothing. nothing. But the soul of the diligent is made fat. Yeah. Proverbs 26, 15 says, A shiftless sluggard puts his fork in the pie, 
but is too lazy to lift it to his mouth. The reality is that following Christ will sometimes, newsflash, take work. Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes it seems like impossible work, but it takes work. And sometimes it may take more work than you want to give. But if you're ever going to grow in Christ, you must be willing to get off the fence and put the work in necessary to develop your faith. Yes, it's going to be difficult. And yes, sometimes it's going to seem like you're constantly going up a mountain. And you're going to be asking God, when does my valley come? When does my descent come? But sometimes you want to constantly be going against resistance. But I've learned that that is just part of the faith. It takes work. And if you got saved, believing that because you got saved, everything is going to be okay. And everything going to work perfectly for you. Then I've got another news flash for you. The Bible says that we all will face trouble. In life, we all face trouble. And there's going to be some trouble. But you've got to change your perspective and roll up your spiritual sleeves and say, I'm just not willing to give up or to give in or to get frustrated because there's some resistance. It will take work and the lazy person will never grow. So that's what some of us look like right now in our scripture. <laughs> See the mountains in the back? <laughs> See the thing about the, the fence mm. is comfortable. You don't have to worry about no dogs barking at him. He can see the mice from way up there. He don't have to worry about his owner coming and bothering him. He can just stay right on the fence. But the moment he wakes up and get on the ground, life's going to start. Uh huh. And then as church people, we've got to learn that life starts when you get saved. Not only the life of freedom, but the life of challenge starts when you get saved. But the Bible says that he who endures to the end shall be saved. And so there are going to be times when you've got to learn to get off the fence, even though it's comfortable, even though you feel yeah. good there, even though it feels good right there. You've got to get off that fence and let God put you in some places that are uncomfortable for you, some places that don't feel good to you, and some places that you really can't predict. But that and that is only time when you can do anything effective for Christ is when you allow him to launch you out into the deep. That's the lesson that Peter learned when they were on the boat and Jesus was walking on the water and Peter said, bid me to come. And the problem was when he got on the water, he saw that the waves were boisterous and he took his eyes off of Jesus and he put his eyes on life and all the stuff that was happening around him. And so his first inclination probably was to get back in the boat. Jesus, will you somehow just get me back in this boat, get me back on this fence? But the Bible says that Jesus in the midst of the water, he lifted his hand out to him and and lifted him on the water and walked with him. Can I tell you that as you walk through life, you may face some trouble and some challenges, but the good thing is you got Jesus walking with you. You've got the master of the sea, the master of the storm that's walking beside you. There's going to be times when the storms are going to rage and trouble's going to be all around you, but you've got the master of the sea that is walking beside you, and you don't have to do it in your own strength. Don't put your eyes on the sea and life, but put your eyes on Jesus. Jesus, abide in him and put your eyes on him and trust him and I promise you that he will never take you back to the fence. He'll walk you through life and you will see God do great and effectual things. Amen. Amen. So what happened with Moses? He wanted to stay on the fence. I can't talk, God, I stutter. What's going to happen when I go back? What is Pharaoh going to think of me? I was raised in his land and his culture. What if I don't get it right? What if I fail? He wanted to stay on the fence. God said, I made your mouth. I'm the one that created you. I'm the one that called you. So you have to get off the fence. Moses still wasn't willing. God had to send Aaron. Who would help talk for him. Take him by the hand. Now, how does it look for the person that's called by God? It's a prophetic moment right here. A person that's called by God. 
to have to be taken by the hand by somebody who was never called to do what they're doing. Do you know that that is one of the greatest challenges that pastors face every Sunday? Is that there are people who are called to do certain things, but because they are on the fence and don't want to do it, wow. then somebody's got to step in who was not originally called to do it, and they got to take that person by the hand and walk with them just to make sure the purposes and the plans of God get fulfilled. But I've learned that God wants some people who don't need nobody to take them by the hand, but they're willing to walk on their own and trust God and know that if Jesus goes with them and the Holy Ghost goes with them, then they got everything they need. He says, he says, and another also said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are in my house. Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the king. The Bible says in Genesis 19 that God delivered Lot and his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. God destroyed it, but there was one instruction that he gave to, Sodom, to Lot and his wife. He says, when you go out of the city, in fact, the scripture says that he says to them, escape for your life. There's some urgency there. There, there. There's some gravity there. He says, I want you to not just leave the city, but I want you to leave it hastily. I want you to escape in my Bible, in the New King James Version, it says, escape for your life with an exclamation mark. And then he adds to that, he says, and by the way, when you are escaping, don't look back. Because if you look back, something bad is going to happen. And we learn from the story that Lot's wife looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. Yeah. Can I tell you the third principle that Christ was teaching this disciple? Is those who truly follow Christ must resist the urge to look back. The Bible says Lot's wife looked back and she turned to a pillar of salt. Why? She looked back because her affections were with what was behind her instead of what was in front of her. Her attention on what was now her past instead of what was in her future. Sometimes when the road gets hard, it's tempting to just take a moment and to peek behind you to look back and see what all seemed good behind you. But can I tell you today, saints of God, that no strong follower of Christ ever looks back. Satan will try to get you to look at your past and all the stuff that you've done and try to hold you bondage to your sin and your past lifestyle. But can I tell you that God has called his people to never look back. There's one songwriter said that said, I won't look back. I'm moving ahead. I'm here to declare to you my past is over in you. He said, you make all things new. Can I tell you there's nothing back there for you. You may say it got harder since I got saved. But can I tell you, there's nothing back there for you. You may say things have become lonely since I got saved. Can I tell you, there's nothing back there for you. You may say, I don't have fun no more since I got saved. But there's nothing back there for you. That is the one challenge that every saint must resist. And that is the challenge to look back. I'm here to tell you, don't even look back to yesterday. Things might not have gone good for you yesterday. Don't even look back to yesterday. But look forward to what God has taken you and keep your eyes where God has told you to put your eyes. 
here's a sobering thought. Theologians believe that Lot's wife, God allowed her or chose salt as the way for her to be solidified because that was the common currency of the day. So a woman who had promise ahead of her chose to look back and merely became a commodity. Something for people to trade. And so when that salt was taken, her memory was gone. Simply because she looked back. That's what Satan wants to do in our lives. He wants to make you a byword. He wants you to look back so you have no effectiveness going forward. So that you can focus on what's behind you and he can get you depressed. Looking at everything that's not the way you like it to be. God is telling this disciple. He says, any person that put their hand to the plow and look back, it's not fit for the king. We must resist the urge, saints, to look back. As I close this morning, I want to encourage you. Some of you today, you need to get off the fence. I don't really know what that means in your life. But it means something different in all of our lives. Amen. It may be spiritually. It may be something physical. It may be something relational. It may be something emotional. But God is saying today, it's time for you to take action. It's time for you to move forward. If your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to pray for someone first who say, Pastor, my life is just not right. I've been straddling this fence. Had one leg on one side, another leg on the other side long enough. And I need God to transform my life. I mean, I, I need to truly be transformed. 